Good morning. Welcome to worship. So glad to connect with you in this uh, virtual means yet again. And uh, just a reminder, we will continue to provide a virtual, uh, virtual worship service for uh, those who are unable or cannot attend our in-person worship. Uh, we are worshiping in person in the church sanctuary each and every Sunday at 10 a.m. In addition to these virtual worship services, uh, and I've had a number of emails from uh, those that uh, are very grateful that we continue to provide this virtual format. Uh, either way, today is Father's Day, and a very, very special day, in some ways a challenging day for some, and we'll be talking about that a little later in the service. Um, but for now, I just want to say, so glad you're here. God is with us this day, and I know that during these next moments together, he is going to dispense his grace, his mercy, his understanding of scripture, many other facets to our worship this day. So glad that you have joined us. As we enter into worship, I invite you to read together this uh, common confession of faith that we all hold so dear. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Please join me in today's invitation to worship. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven, who knew us and chose us before the world began, who loves us so much that he calls us his own children, who has brought us up from darkness into light and filled us with his glorious power who has prepared an inheritance for you that will never spoil or fade, who encourages and strengthens us in every good deed and word, who comforts us in our troubles so that you can comfort others. This is our God, the ultimate source of all things and the one for whom we live. Let us worship together.
Well, welcome to worship. A very special welcome to our younger worshipers today. Uh, be you uh, worshiping as someone who is young in age or young in heart, we're glad you're here. I'd like to take a moment just to share a couple of thoughts about Father's Day and what we might do for Dad today. You know, that's more of a challenging question than uh, we might normally think of. Um, a lot of times we uh, provide something to Dad that he might not otherwise be able to enjoy. Uh, sometimes just a Sunday afternoon nap is a, is a wonderful gift and just let Dad be and have a few moments of quiet. But, you know, that's a gift that Mom appreciates too, so that isn't necessarily something that is only for Dads. Uh, we may choose to cook him lunch or brunch after church today. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> Moms appreciate being cooked for as well, and so it's hard to think about just exactly what is special about that for Dad on Father's Day. I've also brought with me today uh, a toolbox, and in my toolbox I have uh, an assortment of tools that I use to repair and build things. You know, once upon a time, uh, we used to think about a toolbox or a tool for the toolbox as a special gift for Dad on Father's Day. But then we got a little wiser, and we realized, you know what, moms are pretty good at building things as too, and they are just as in need of a toolbox as dads are. So with that in mind, what in the world do we give to Dad on Father's Day? You know what? As I've thought about that question, and as I, uh, as I think about what we could give to God this Father's Day, um, I think about uh, the fact that we all have a heavenly Father. And uh, even though we might struggle a bit with knowing what to give our earthly father, and I'm sure he will appreciate whatever cards or, or uh, uh, expressions of appreciation you do for our earthly father today, uh, let's think a moment about what can we do for our heavenly father? You know, that might be an even more challenging question because what do we do for God? I mean, he has it all, right? Well, fortunately, Scriptures give us a very clear instruction on what we can do for God on Father's Day or, for that matter, any other day. In, uh, in the Gospels, Jesus said this, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king, that is God, will reply, Truly I tell you, whoever or whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So when we think about Father's Day and what we can do for our Heavenly Father this day, the answer is pretty simple. When we do something out of kindness and mercy and grace for another human being, we are doing something for God himself. This is the greatest gift that we can offer to God. We can offer to God the opportunity to show his love to other people in very tangible and specific ways. I think that would be a wonderful gift, not only for our earthly father, but certainly a wonderful gift for our heavenly father. Please join me in prayer. In addition to the prayers that I have prepared this day, I also invite us to begin thinking about those particularly in need of our prayer, members of our family, uh, our workplace, our friends, who are in need of God's grace in a very special way this day. Let us take a few moments now to go to prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing us and caring for us in all our needs. Constantly intercede for us before our Heavenly Father and open our eyes that we may see him through you. We ask all this in your holy name, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, focus our love today on people we know with special needs. Heal those who are unwell and others in need, whom we now name before you, before your throne of mercy and grace. Lord, as we continue in prayer this day, we thank you for this special weekend, this holiday that we have named Father's Day. 
It certainly is a, a very well-deserved holiday to honor our dads, to honor our fathers. Father, we know it's a challenging day as well, because we know sometimes, uh, Lord, we want to honor an earthly father who is no longer with us. We're grateful for the hope of resurrection that we have in Jesus Christ. And while we may be absent from our father and our physical being, spiritually we remain connected. And we live in the hope of being reunited once again in your eternal kingdom. Father, uh, some of us struggle because uh, our fathers were imperfect, and we struggle at times to know just how to forgive. Lord, we pray today, help us to extend grace and mercy to dads who, in so many, most all cases, did the best they could, but like us, have made their mistakes as well. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a heart of grace and forgiveness for those times when maybe dads haven't lived up to even their own expectations. Father, show us this day how we can honor our earthly dads. We've talked a little bit about how we can honor you. How can we honor our earthly fathers this day, be they present with us or not? Obviously, things like phone calls and alleviating some of the daily duties that dad normally attends to, these are all great ways to honor our dads. But reveal to us in our hearts the specific needs and concerns. Enlighten our minds and hearts by your Holy Spirit so that our particular father or fathers might be honored by us this day. Lord, we know, we know that uh, Father's Day is not a religious holiday per se, but it certainly is a day that reflects uh, the scriptures and reflects the truth that we have a heavenly father. So with that in mind, we offer to you the prayer that our Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Many of you know that I was away last weekend, and uh, Bill Veneta uh, filled in very ably, uh, filling the pulpit in our in-person worship. I'm always thrilled when uh, Bill and others are able to fill pulpit, and the congregation, all of us, are enriched, enriched through the different perspectives and uh, style of ministry that each of these folks bring to the pulpit. Uh, the, during the time in which I was away, uh, the annual conference of the Florida United Methodist Church took place. Uh, I was uh, given an official opportunity to not attend conference in order to be away this past weekend for a family event, and so I'm grateful. But I did want to just mention one aspect to annual conference. Uh, we'll be providing a fuller report in uh, the days ahead. But uh, you may wonder, uh, where do all these tithes and offerings go? Well, they go primarily and will continue to go primarily to supporting our local work, our church and its ministry to our immediate community. But beyond that, we have an opportunity through the United Methodist Church to minister globally as well, and a portion of our tithes and offerings help contribute to that. This year at annual conference, a very special offering was taken up for uh, scholarships at Africa University and the continent of Africa, training African leaders for ministry, as well as for Gammon Theological Seminary here in the United States once again, set for the express purpose of preparing young people uh, or second career people for that matter for ministry within the United Methodist Church or other avenues to which God may call them. There are people serving Jesus today in the continent of Africa because of you and because of me and because of our faithfulness to contribute tithes and offerings to his work. I hope that inspires you, and it's not too different, uh, you know, not so distant from home that we can't appreciate the fact that uh, there is a bigger picture here, and we're part of it. Allow me to pray for these uh, tithes and these offerings, and for each of you who is so faithful to contribute to the work of Mariner United Methodist Church. 
Father, thank you for our congregation, for our resiliency, and for the generosity of a group of people who will continue to worship and do ministry. Lord, over the course of the previous month or two, and uh, now as we uh, continue to move through summer and restrictions continue to ease, our ministry is beginning to expand again. Our facilities are beginning to uh, be more maximized. All these things we're grateful for, none of which would be possible except for the faithfulness of your people. And I pray your blessing upon each giver and each gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me. No doubt some of you are familiar with the story that uh, came out of Spain some years ago. It's a Spanish story of a father and son who had become estranged. And so the son ran away from the father and for years uh, had no contact with his dad nor his dad with the son. The father searched for months and months to try to find his son and to seek out a restoration of the relationship and uh, finally, after months and years of looking, he finally gave up, assuming that uh, there was just no way he could ever find his son. But he made one last very creative attempt to reach out to his son named Paco. He put an ad in the weekly newspaper. And he said, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you. On Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. Now, my understanding is that's a true story. And uh, whether it's uh, true or not, it certainly reminds us of the need to affirm our fathers. Sometimes we become estranged from our dads because of earthly circumstances or things that we may perceive were inappropriate or inaccurate. And we, like this father and son, need to be reunited with our earthly fathers. Whatever the case might be, Father's Day and Mother's Day are two of the most challenging days for me as a pastor to lead worship. Why is that? Well, I recognize what I just said. We're all imperfect. Our moms were imperfect. Our dads are imperfect. We're imperfect as dads and moms. And sometimes this day reminds us of our imperfections and our regrets and the things that we wish we had done better as a parent. And it's certainly as a pastor, it's not my desire to inflict upon any member of our congregation uh, further uh, aches and pains and, and uh, uh, as a result of maybe uh, things we wish we had done better. We all wish we could have done better. 
No doubt about it. Certainly as a father and grandfather, I realize that I'm still learning. It's also a day where sometimes uh, we uh, grew up without a dad or a mom. The circumstances, whatever they may have been, meant that we were raised in a home without a father or a mother. And so for me to talk about Father's Day or Mother's Day is, well, it's a unique challenge because I recognize the reality of having not had that person in our lives, at least not had them in our lives in a traditional sense. Uh, the other thing that is obviously true on a day like today, uh, some of our fathers and mothers, even though uh, we love them dearly, are no longer with us. They are with our Heavenly Father, enjoying eternity with Him, but we still long for their earthly presence, even as we celebrate the hope of resurrection. In some cases, uh, we have a parent who's in a skilled nursing facility, and Lord, their, uh, their twilight years, if you were, have not been and are not particularly pleasant. And so all of these reasons and more make celebrating and worshiping on Father's and Mother's Day a bit of a challenge. And so today I recognize, first of all, that all these challenges exist and that God's grace and power to experience his presence, even in the absence of a parent that we wish was still with us, is still very powerful. But I would also like to remind us that whatever our earthly situation has been relative to our fathers or our mothers, but particularly our fathers, we all have a heavenly father. We all have a heavenly father, and, and that's the father I'd like to point us to today. The father that we all have in common, and whatever the earthly situation of our relationship with our earthly father, I offer to you words of scripture, words of encouragement, words of hope that define what it means to have an amazing heavenly father. So I invite you to follow along while I read this passage of scripture from the Apostle Paul written to the church in Galatia. Paul writes, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. And now these very, very important words. But... Sometimes the most important words in Scripture are the transitions. But in contrast to that, in other words, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, and uh, by extension, his daughters as well, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. That passage of scripture reminds us of the relationship that is possible for you and for me and for every man, woman, and child on this earth to have with a heavenly father that transcends whatever fatherly, earthly experience we may have had. In order to understand this relationship, the Apostle Paul appeals to something that uh, his audience, and as well our audience today, has some understanding of, and it is the principle of adoption. We all know that uh, adoption is, is a means by which a parent might legally uh, take on the responsibility of parenting for another child whose earthly parents may not be able to do so for whatever reason. And adoption is a legal process that allows that person to adopt a son or a daughter and basically to uh, have all the rights and responsibilities that come with being a full-pledged parent. Uh, in a day of blended families, certainly we are familiar with this concept, but uh, it's been a, a legal concept and a means of caring for children that's been around for centuries and was around in the Apostle Paul's time as well. And according to this scripture, 
By virtue of our faith in Jesus Christ, God has adopted you, God has adopted me as his sons and daughters. We have been fully adopted by God. And that means we are fully included as his children. And the passage goes on to explain three benefits of this relationship. Allow me for just a few moments to highlight each of those. The first benefit that comes from being adopted by our Heavenly Father is we are indwelled by God's Spirit. We are indwelled by God's Spirit. That's a very, very important concept to understand and, and somewhat difficult. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior elsewhere in Scripture, we know at that point that the Holy Spirit of God comes to rest in our beings in a way that uh, to that point was not quite the same. He becomes an internal witness of our relationship with God. And uh, we begin to hear this voice within our hearts that tells us that we are not just a, a random act of creation. We are a child of Almighty God. And we are indwelled by his spirit. And this indwelling of the spirit is kind of like a sealing, a notary seal. It's a guarantee. You know, when we go through an earthly adoption, there are legal, uh, there's legal paperwork. And uh, that paperwork must be approved in some legal way. And usually, even in our culture, when certain items have been approved uh, uh, by the uh, legal structure of a culture, there is a stamp or a seal placed upon that item to say that this has been approved. That is certainly true with things like uh, paying off a mortgage. Uh, it is certainly true with uh, certain things that we have to do to apply. We're probably most familiar with this concept uh, when you and I have to go someplace to get a document notarized that guarantees that the signature on that piece of paper really is ours. These are all examples of seals, of signs, that say that this document and what that document represents is fully legal. It is uh, very much the same way with God, except God doesn't put a seal on a piece of paper. God puts a seal on our hearts, and that seal is the Holy Spirit who comes into our hearts and reminds us that we are his children. In fact, in the passage that I read a moment ago, we can call God Abba Father, Abba being kind of the more familiar term for a father called Daddy because we're his children, because we have the imprint of the Holy Spirit within us, we can begin to feel comfortable coming to a God as, as great and majestic as he is and call him daddy. So because we are adopted by our Heavenly Father, we are indwelled by God's Spirit, and that is God's seal to tell us that we are his children, and nothing can rip that relationship away from us. Speaking of children, the second benefit of being adopted by, God, by um, uh, our Heavenly Father is a reminder that not only are we indwelled by God's Spirit, but we are affirmed as God's children. We are affirmed as God's children. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need some affirmation. I just don't feel maybe worthy enough or, or good enough for, for God to care and love me the way the Bible says that he does. Oh, I, I believe the scriptures, but emotionally, I just don't maybe always feel it. Maybe it's times when maybe I feel I've disappointed God in some way, or at least disappointed myself, or maybe I'm not growing in, in my faith as, as deeply as I should, whatever the case may be. And at this point in time, God steps in and affirms us as his children, and he compares in the passage the difference in his world between a child and a slave. Now, certainly we are familiar with the concept of slavery, but as Paul is using it here, it's a little bit different. You see, in a household in the ancient world, there would be sons and daughters, biological sons and daughters of the, of the owner of the, ho of the, the head of the house. Uh, in many cases, uh, there would be slaves as well. Uh, the slaves were essentially hired hands who were there to work, uh, help uh, in some capacity in running the household. But the slaves, they were not children. Uh, and uh, social status-wise, uh, only the children had a right to address the head of the household as a parent. Slaves might indeed be quite well off financially, but still not a part of the family. 
God says that when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we become a child of God in a very unique sense. Now, I recognize that from the standpoint of creation, all people, all people are children of God because no one has been created apart from the will of God and the power of God to bring uh, creation and reproduction into human existence. But if you are familiar with the Bible, you understand the Bible also talks about a second birth, a spiritual birth, a spiritual rebirth. For those that have chosen to surrender their life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and as the Holy Spirit enters into the life, the Bible says these are the people who now are spiritually God's children, not just physically God's children as well. And for those of you watching today and participating in worship, I offer you the affirmation that you are God's child if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ. If not, Father's Day would be a wonderful time to start. To say, Lord Jesus, I know that uh, I've sinned. I know that in some ways I've disappointed. I'd like for you to cleanse me of my sin and help me to know yet again that God is not just uh, my physical father <laughs> in a sense that he allowed me to be created, but he is my spiritual father as well. The third benefit of being adopted by God, in addition to the fact that we're indwelled by his spirit, that we are affirmed as his children, but we also are declared to be his heirs. We are the heirs of God. <laughs> heirs of what? <laughs> uh, some of us look around at our bank accounts or our 401k or the amount of property we earn and says, <laughs> there doesn't seem to be much there by way of inheritance. I've already told my children and grandchildren, uh, you know, you, you better work hard because uh, <laughs> there's not a whole lot coming when mom and I are gone. There's a little bit there and we trust it will be helpful to them. But as we read this story and uh, God refers to you and I as heirs, we may wonder, I feel more like a spiritual pauper than someone who's an heir to a fortune. Well, the reality is that the Bible tells us that what we are about to inherit by way of eternal life from Jesus Christ, and while we haven't experienced it fully, we fully possess it in the here and now. Yeah, we don't have to wait until we die in order to experience the blessings of being a part of God's kingdom and of being one of his heirs. We may not experience it in totality, but we are fully possession of it today. And allow me to close by just mentioning three specific ways in which uh, the, being an heir of Jesus Christ impacts our life today. First of all, prayer. We can talk to God. I've already mentioned the fact that uh, God is our father. God is our daddy. And we can talk to them on those terms by virtue of the forgiveness and grace that is extended to us through Jesus Christ. Prayer is a reminder that we were heirs of God because we are exercising a right that God has given to us to approach his throne in the here and now that we are fully in possession of. So prayer is one way in which uh, we can utilize being an heir of God in the present life. The power of God. Most of us can attest to circumstances that seemed overwhelming at the time, that uh, somehow in the midst of us, we experience the grace of Almighty God and his strength and power to endure and come through a very difficult situation that otherwise we're not sure at all that we could have survived. And so the power of God is another way in which we are experiencing in the here and now the fact that we are heirs of God of everything. And the, the final thing I would offer to you that is true of those that are uh, declared to be the heirs of God is purpose. God has endowed his children with significance. We can serve him in ways that truly make a difference within our church, within our communities, within our world. Sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, you know, what's my purpose? And so we begin a dialogue and a conversation. I begin to ask about what their strengths and challenges are, what they enjoy doing. We talk about spiritual gifts in order to define the opportunity to feel the significance of purpose in our life. This all comes with being an heir to all eternity, but experiencing that eternity even in the here and now. Whatever our earthly situation was or is relative to our earthly fathers, we have a heavenly father who has adopted you and adopted me as his children. As because we are adopted, we're indwelled by his spirit. We're affirmed as his children. 
and we are declared to be his heirs. God bless you today. Your Heavenly Father loves you so very much. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. For it was grace that bought my liberty. I'll never know just why he came to love me so. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift my eyes to Calvary to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that brought it down to me. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I shall forever lift my to view the cross where Jesus died for me. How marvelous the grace that caught my falling soul. He looked behind my fault and saw